So, um, yeah, my name is Stephanie Williams. I'm a respiratory therapist. I've been a respiratory therapist for, I think it's 400 years. <laughs> it's, I've lost track, but it's, 400, it's at least 400. I used to be a really tall person. Um, I worked at the hospital for many years and I ran my legs off. So, <laughs> so it, all healthcare providers in the room understand. <laughs> you, I would get home in the afternoons and my Fitbit would say, you've walked eight miles today inside of a building. So yes, you, you do have a lot of that. But um, I am from the COPD Foundation. A um, little bit about, about my background. Did a lot of my work in hospital space, but I did a lot of work in home health. I did some work with DME companies. So um, DME companies are the ones that give you the oxygen equipment, um, hospital beds, wheelchairs, that kind of thing. So I did a lot of work with that, going out into patients' homes and helping them understand the equipment they have, setting patients up on ventilators in their homes. And then I did um, quite a bit of work going around the country, setting up ventilator units in skilled nursing facilities. So I've seen COPD in a lot of different areas. But my passion now is education. So I think my experience has been that everybody wants to do better. Everybody wants to feel better. Everybody wants to feel the best they can feel. But they can only do as much as they know. So we've got to educate, and we've got to inform, and we have to empower, and that's what I love to do. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I need to say up front, I don't have any conflicts of interest. This is all I do. So I don't have any money coming in from the, you know, these manufacturers or pharmaceutical companies. This is it. So I wanted to start out this morning and give you just some, some numbers that you can start to wrap your brain around. There are more than 30 million people in this country, just, just in this country, that have COPD, but only half of them know it. So that's, that's the startling number, right? So 30 million people have it, 15 million of them know it, those other 15 million won't probably know it until they have something that sends them to the hospital for the first time. Because COPD is a sneaky disease. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But these, these symptoms here, right here, can you see the little red dot, how fancy we are? But many people with COPD mistake their symptoms. They think, oh, well, I'm just getting older, or oh, I'm just out of shape. And you just heard Joelle a few minutes ago talking about her cardiac issues and how she would take a few steps and then have to stop. COPD is similar. So this is why a lot of COPD patients don't know they have COPD in the first place because their symptoms are similar to cardiac. So we think, oh, I'm just getting older. Oh, I'm just out of shape. Oh, I've just had this cold for a while. Can't get rid of it. No, I've got allergies or no, I have asthma. So any of these things that you have, any of these symptoms, should prompt you to go ahead and go to the doctor and say, sometimes I get out of breath when I'm going upstairs. Or sometimes when I bend over to tie my shoes, it makes me out of breath. So when I say COPD is sneaky, these are the symptoms that sneak up. So going up the stairs. Patients that I've had in the past that would say, oh, well, you know, I just, I just don't do that anymore. I don't do the things that make me out of breath. So no, I'm not out of breath. Or, oh, well, yeah, those shoes, you know, when I bend over to tie my shoes, I get out of breath. So I just buy shoes and I stick my feet in and go. Does any of this <laughs> sound familiar? All right, so it's super important for you to keep these words in mind. There is never a good reason to be short of breath, and there's no such thing as a healthy cough. Okay, so those symptoms right there should be enough to say, hey, doc, something's up, let's do a couple of tests. All right, so more startling numbers. So here we are in our great state of Tennessee, and I'd like for you to look at our number here. We are holding steady in third place. We are behind West Virginia and Kentucky in incidence rates of COPD. So we are not at the top of very many lists, but we are at the top of the COPD list. So several years ago, the COPD Foundation started to try to implement a um, a pilot program here and they wanted to put a respiratory therapist on the ground to try and um, share all the COPD foundation programs and that was me 
So I've been going from Memphis to Bristol for the past three years, trying to educate people and share information with groups like this about the resources that COPD Foundation has and ways to become engaged and uh, proactive in your healthcare. All right, so many people with COPD, 64.2% of them said that COPD had affected their quality of life. Now here's where I want you to be involved with me. In what ways does COPD affect people's lives? Go ahead. Walking hills. Walking hills. Walking at all. Walking at all. Doing housework. Housework. What else? Breathing. <laughs> Breathing. <laughs> what, what else? Bending over. Bending over. What else? Everything. Yes. I heard intimacy up here at the front. Yes. What else? Conversation. Conversation. Everything. Every part of their life. Every single part. There's nothing that's not affected. So um, when, when they say 64.2% of people said it affected their quality of life, I look at that number and go, so we have 36% liars? <laughs> 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 because everybody should be saying it impacts me in some way. It affects my quality of life in some way. 17.7% um, have been hospitalized. 50% uh, take at least one medication every day. The one at the top is the one that I want for those of you that are not affected right now with COPD. This is the number that I want you to take away. Almost 25% of people with COPD have never smoked. Did you associate it with just a smoker's disease? Yes. Okay, 25%, at least 25% of our patients have never smoked, have never held one in their hand, have never lived with a smoker. So if you think, well, I haven't ever smoked, so I can't have COPD, erase that from your head. Okay, it, the stigma of it being a smoker's disease needs to really go away. Uh, so we see here that it impacts uh, based on income, it makes, uh, impacts based on race, age, and this one often surprises people. Are you surprised that it impacts more women than men? No. Anybody surprised at that? That typically, um, that number typically surprises our healthcare people because we associate it with men. But that is just not true. Yes, ma'am. What about the, the household cleaning products? Household cleaning problems are big problems. The irritants. Um, I have a few patients right now that can only clean with very mild vinegar and um, water because anything else in the house at all will cause them to have a flare up and be in the hospital. So they have to be very aware of triggers that would cause these flare ups, these exacerbations. They have to be very, very aware of those things that would cause irritation cause inflammation to happen in the lungs. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what it is. Um, again, I don't want you to associate with the smokers, with the smokers disease because these things can happen to any of us. There is a very, um, it's, relatively, it's a relatively new thing that we are treating now. It's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You know, we've known about it for a while, but we always thought it was pretty rare. It's genetic. Um, it's a genetic disease. Uh, it actually affects the liver. It causes the body to not create certain enzymes and proteins that protect the lungs. Uh, it mimics other diseases all along. But anyway, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a huge, huge piece of the, the COPD world. And the best practice is if you have COPD, you need to talk to your doctor about being tested for alpha-1 because it may actually be alpha-1 that you have. So COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is a serious lung disease. There is no cure for it at this time, but we are doing a better job at recognizing it early and treating symptoms and managing symptoms and helping people um, have better quality of life. So the components of the COPD are emphysema and bronchitis. Sometimes we have refractory asthma. That means uh, there are different types of asthma. Some types of asthma respond well to those breathing treatments, those puffers, and some of them don't. So there are different types of asthma. And then some forms of uh, bronchiectasis. So what happens in COPD? Okay. 
So what happens in COPD, if you look up here at the top, you see these little bundles, it looks like little clusters of grapes, right? Those are the alveoli, tiny, tiny little air sacs at the very, very ends of your airways. So when you take a breath in, you're going to take a breath in through your nose. Can you feel your chest expand? Go ahead and let it out. Y'all are a compliant little group, aren't you? <laughs> you would have sat there until I told you to let it out. <laughs> so you take a breath in and you feel your lungs expand, you feel your rib cage expand. All of that expansion is happening because that air is going in through the nose, down the airway, through the bronchial tubes, and out into these alveoli. And they're getting full, like little balloons. Okay, and that's going to be important in a minute. So these little alveoli, they expand when you take a breath. It forces the oxygen out to the edges. The, the blood supply runs by and picks up the oxygen and takes off to the rest of the body. It's the coolest thing ever. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide from your body is coming back up to the alveoli and getting back into the lung and you're gonna blow it out. Okay, so that's where we call it gas exchange. That's where that happens. So that's great as long as those little alveoli are doing their job. Sometimes though, they're not pink and healthy. Sometimes they're kind of yucky and distended and floppy and they can't squeeze the air back out that you take in. So let's do this breath one more time. Take a breath in, now blow it out. Now for those of you that have these pink and healthy alveoli, you're able to blow that out right away. People with COPD don't have any trouble taking the breath in. They have trouble getting the breath out. So when they have trouble, follow my logic here, when they have trouble pushing that breath out, that then makes the next breath what? It's less. Less, right. You're getting, you're able to get less air in that next time because you, you're kind of keeping some of your space locked up, that old air. Some of you guys in here with COPD have got air locked in there from 1977. <laughs> right? It just can't get out of there. So there are tricks and there are tools that we can use to help you force that air out so that you can make room for your next breath. Because folks, that's the one we all want, right? You want the next one. I'm done with this one. I want my next one. So we'll talk a little bit about that here. What are some of the symptoms of COPD? Coughing. Does every cough mean that you have COPD? No. But, and, and, does every COPD patient have a cough? No. But can it be one of the symptoms? Yes. Shortness of breath. That is a very clear symptom. Excess sputum or phlegm? Can be. Feeling like you can't get your breath in? Mm -hmm. Feeling like it doesn't go very far? A lot of times my patients will say it just feels like it goes to about right here and stops. So I want you to think about what we just talked about a minute ago. If I can take a breath in, but I can't let it out, taking up that room. It's like filling up a glass. If you've got a pitcher of water and an empty glass, and they say, pour me some water in that glass. Now pour some of that water out. Now pour some more water in. Pour a little bit out. It's still not going to take long until that glass is running over, right? Because there's no more room. There's only so much expansion that can happen. So not everyone with COPD has a chronic cough. Not everyone with a cough has COPD or will develop it in the future. I need to say that because I don't want everybody running out of here thinking, oh my word, here I go, I'm, not, I'm on my last leg. That's just not, that's not true, but the cough is a big one. Okay, so how does COPD affect your breathing? Now this is where I brought along some props. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how well this works. Okay. So you have, can y'all hear me? It's a benefit of having a lot of kids, y'all. I can yell, I can holler. All right, so COPD, those little alveoli, if you'll look with me here, in the normal lungs, you should be able to count 14 different pockets. That's a lot of surface area, okay? 14 different pockets, expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting acting a lot like this balloon. Now, I will confess to you now that my asthma has been acting up this morning. We will see if I can do this. 
So here is our balloon. What do you think is going to happen when I let this go? The air is going to what? The air is going to come out, and what will my balloon look like? It'll look like it did when I first brought it out of my bag, right? So it expanded like it was supposed to, and then it went right back to its normal shape. I could do it again and let it go, and it's going to go right back to its normal shape. Normal, healthy lungs. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the lungs with bronchitis in them. If you'll notice there, um, there's stuff in the tubes. Okay? Um, I know some of y'all have been eating this morning. We won't go into a whole big detail about it. But it's when you would cough that up, there would be a productive cough. <laughs> I can talk about this and eat a sandwich at the same time. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> the, benefits of, <laughs> the benefits of being a respiratory for a long, long time. So anyway, you see the stuff that's kind of building up in the airways, and you would need to cough that out. If you will notice, look at how much room there is between like in a space in the airways. Is there a lot of room for air to go by? There's not. So when you hear people that sound like they're whistling when they breathe, that air has to go around all that junk in the airways. So it's kind of like, it's just wheezing. It's just that air hitting those narrow air areas of the tubes and they just can't, the air can't go through very well. Notice also that because the airflow is limited, the expansion is limited in the alveoli. line. You see that? They are not, they're not filling up nearly as much as our healthy ones are. You see? So we're already having an airflow limitation. We're already not getting all the oxygen that we need. So let's talk about emphysema. I'm going to bring out a different bag. So emphysema, this one has 14 different points, different pockets, lots of surface area for oxygen to exchange and the, in the, make the gas exchange happen. What happens to emphysema over here? We just got two, right? We've got two spots. All of the walls that were in between each of those little alveoli, they're destroyed. So instead of having lots and lots of little grapey clusters, you got one big one, and they're kind of floppy. So, anybody been to the grocery store lately? Anybody pull these off for your produce? Yeah. All right, so remember my balloon with my normal healthy lungs. <coughs> What's going to happen to this when I let it go? Yeah, it's going to go out slowly. Can it squeeze the air out? So if I were to try to blow more air in, am I able to do that very much? So these are lungs with emphysema. Floppy. Ineffective. Sorry, guys. But this is the best visual I could give you. The balloon opening, expanding, and then shrinking right back down like they're supposed to. And these are just not able, I would I mean, I had to squeeze the air out. Did you see that? So how can we do that? How can I teach you guys to squeeze the air out of your lungs? That doesn't sound fun, does it? But, we'll come back to this maybe. Breathing techniques. How much time do I have? <coughs> Jennifer, y'all know, I'm just, I can talk about this for 17 years. So just flag me down when I'm running out of time. <laughs> Breathing techniques. This is a huge deal. My friend Jeremy back there is going to talk about pulmonary rehab in a few minutes. And this is, or he's going to talk about the cardiac side, sorry. But in pulmonary rehab, they talk about how to breathe. There are two different types of breathing techniques that we're going to talk about here in just a second. How many, how many folks just real low, just raise your hand if you're not too bothered. Tell me how many of you have COPD. You need to lie here. <coughs> How many of you have COPD? Okay. 
So we're going to talk about these breathing techniques. First one's called first lip breathing. And it's very, very important. We're going to breathe in through our nose for the count of two. And then we're going to breathe out through our lips. But here's the catch. You're going to have to pucker up to blow out. So I don't want you to feel self-conscious about it because everybody's going to be doing it. <laughs> so we're going to breathe in for the count of two. And then we're going to pucker up and blow out for the count of four at least. Okay, the trick would be to blow out for as long as you need to to empty your lungs out. But we want to do it for at least four. So everybody's going to do it with me. Are you ready? In through your nose. Pucker up. Blow out. Keep blowing if you need to. It's actually very relaxing. This is great for you to remove that carbon dioxide from the body. It really helps you free up that space for that next breath, you know, the one that we want. So this is a really big deal. This is a huge, a huge asset for people with COPD. This is a tool they need in their toolbox. So when they're up and they're moving around and they're short of breath or they're exercising or they're whatever and they're, they're like, whoo, I just can't seem to get that breath in, stop. Let's do our first lip reading. And it really does help. Anybody tried it before? Can I it? Does it make you lightheaded? Usually no. Usually that's, um, if you're taking that huge deep breath, if you're not a COPD patient, you're taking that huge deep breath in, um, it can kind of force oxygen into, into your bloodstream really quickly. But generally for our COPD patients, we're just trying to get them to focus on their breath so they can blow out. We don't want people hyperventilating. We just want them forcing all of the air out of the can. So let's do it one more time. Breathing in. Pucker up. And keep blowing out if you need to. So that is purse slit breathing. And again, that is the greatest tool COPD patients can have in their toolbox. <coughs> Diaphragmatic breathing is a little bit different. It really teaches control and it really teaches the person to try to utilize their diaphragm as their main muscle of breathing again. So what they would do is lean back in a chair or lie it on a couch, um, but you would put one hand where your diaphragm is right under your rib cage, and put your other hand on your chest wall up high. Because sometimes what happens when people are struggling to get their breath, they end up breathing like this. They breathe with their shoulders. But what we want is for people to start breathing with their diaphragms. So when you take a breath in, what you should what you should see is the hand on your diaphragm would move out. And when you breathe out, it should come in. So when you take a breath in and out. You feel it? And you have to think about it. So those are the two main tools that I would that I would encourage people with COPD to really practice. And that does take practice. And using those techniques when you don't need them will help you to use it when you when you do muscle memory type thing. Anybody have any questions for me? One thing that I did want to mention for those that have COPD, the COPD Foundation, we exist just to provide education and information to people who have COPD or have loved ones with COPD. Everything that we provide to you guys would be free. We just ask you to call our information line here or go to our website and if you're needing more information they send it to your house we're not going to ask you for your firstborn child we just really want to share information with you 